And my name is Kirsten. And thank you all for coming. This evening, we are hearing from uh, Lois, Christine, and Carolyn all about horses and horse medicine. And I can't wait. Um, sorry, I forgot one thing. We do like to thank the ancestors, um, acknowledging that we are residing within the Paul First Nation territory. So we like to thank the ancestors for this beautiful land and space that we have to enjoy. Thank you. If you haven't already, we'll invite you during the break um, to choose an equine exploration card that you're drawn to. There is a book to give insight on the gift, the challenge, and the journey, so we can do that during the break after the talk. So what happens when we're in the company of horses? The way of the horse is a prescription for engaging the universe. It's practically intoxicating at times because you're learning to play with magic. That's a quote from Dr. Alan Hamilton, who's a Harvard-trained brain surgeon and the author of Zen Horse, Zen Mind. To connect with horses, we need to enter the world of energy. After all, we're all bubbles of energy. We must learn to quiet our minds, mute the left hemisphere into silence, and be totally in present moment focus. Being with horses is about relationship. It helps us to better understand ourselves. But how does that happen? Horses are reactive, 1,200-pound sentient beings with no ego, no agenda. They're hyper-vigilant by nature, and they miss nothing. As animals of prey, they are hardwired by nature to constantly assess their environment. They are able to read the silent intention of others, and they assess their own safety. And they are never wrong. It is a prerequisite for their survival and their very life depends on it. If they were wrong, they might become a meal for a predator. Horses are masters of mindfulness, being fully present in their mind, body, soul, and the world around them. That is how they survive in the world of predators in the wild. And we as humans are predators. If they are uncomfortable with the presence of a being in their vicinity, they will leave. Horses are, unable, are able to detect the most minute changes in blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tension, energy, and of course they are experts at reading body language. And they notice instantly as soon as something changes. They are a barometer of the inner state of the person in front of them. Speaking of body language, this is a quote from Nature of Things, Decoding Body Language from 2017. Body language is the authentic primal form of communication from head to toe. The body does not lie. The body expresses what's going on in the mind, and there's micro expressions that are quick and fleeting. Our face actually has 43 muscles and more than 10,000 expressions. And horses are the masters of reading body language. They notice immediately when anything changes, and they will react to it. When you're in the company of horses in a safe environment, and they start to react, be mindful of your own inner state. Maybe there's a tightness in your chest, perhaps some muscle tension or butterflies in your stomach. You can do a quick body scan to become aware of what your body is saying and just take note of it and stay in your body awareness. Horses will scan and read this information from your body. They do not have cognitive override. They're just reacting to what your body is saying because the body doesn't lie and horses never lie. And it's an ongoing assessment to sense if your energy is weak or strong or indecisive. Horses mirror the uh, unspoken emotional states of humans. If a person is incongruent, then there will be tension, and the horses feel that. Keeping in mind that horses all have their own personalities, some are much more sensitive and reactive than others. For example, my Kalua here, that's him at work, um, he's very vivid and dramatic. When he senses resistance to incongruence, he will often rear straight up in a gateway, no less. He is very sensitive to repressed emotions. Other horses that he works with, they might just flatten their ears or they might tighten their mouth, and the clients may not notice that. But it's hard to miss a 1,200-pound Kahlua rearing straight up. <laughs> horses are social animals, and they are also masters of team building, and they do this naturally in their herd. Safety is their number one concern, and they're always safest when they're in a herd. We have a lot to learn from the social herd dynamic of nonverbal communication, collaboration, and cooperation. 
As you adjust your inner state and you become congruent and acknowledge what is going on in your body and your mind, it will be reflected in the horse's behavior and his reaction to you. As you change, they change. Being able to read and translate a horse's body language speaks volumes about the person in front of the horse. It gives incredible insight to the inner state of the human, although people don't always like what they see. In this way, horses help facilitate self-awareness, self-knowledge, awareness of one's own energy. Horses are amazing teachers in the realm of personal and professional development, leadership skills, and life skills. They co-partner with mental health professionals to bring about amazing results. There seems to be no end to what horses can teach humans. It is powerfully therapeutic when you have a shift of consciousness and a big aha moment in front of a 1,200 pound being. You remember what that feels like. This happened to me when a little gray horse Calypso came into my life in the fall of 2011. This horse changed the very direction of my life. I'd just like to share a little bit about being in the company of Calypso. I'd always wanted to be with horses since I was about four, but raised as a city girl, I never got the chance to be with them until I was in my 40s. That's why I met Chris. <laughs> Before I had the chance to learn and ride and be with them, I discovered many years later that horses had a lot more to offer me than just a passion for the sport. In 2011 of September, Calypso the Azteca horse came to live with us. He was so much different from my other horses. It seemed like he was able to read my mind and finish my sentences. He was faster than me and smarter than me and quicker on every level. Riding and working with Calypso at Liberty was like a mind game, but it was a great passion. It often felt like it was playing chess balance on 1,200 pounds of explosive horse, both of us always waiting for the next move of each other. I soon learned that it had to be in balance, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally and in some ways spiritually, in order to feel that energetic flow between us. Calypso is lovely. He's brilliant, he's sweet, he's friendly, but he's extremely sensitive with a keen sense of injustice. He's a lot of fun, and he's full of mischief. When I would finally achieve a few moments of harmony and energy flow with Calypso, we would float across the meadow, and I was like, ah, oh, it's like a meeting of the minds, and I thought, this horse is teaching me about myself. As I react, he reacts, and vice versa. When you're in that flow, it gives you energy. You're tapping into the energy of something much greater. A quote from Dominique Barbier, he said, the feeling we experience when we're with our horse in that bubble is extraordinary. And in that space, nothing can touch us. It became evident to me that I had to develop a better version of myself in order to gain Calypso's attention, his trust, and the role of his leader. Talk about personal development. In front of the horse, he misses nothing. But first, I had to overcome the daily fear of working and riding with him. He came with a few quirks, as did I. <laughs> he could spin 180 degrees, bolt across the road, and back me into ditches. I soon found out that my love for this horse, though, was a lot greater than the fear. In order to see some change in his behavior, I had to change mine. So I slowly learned how to transmute some of the energy of fear that I could use and redirect harmoniously with Calypso. It didn't eliminate the fear, but it taught me to deal with it better. And this is a skill that I use often in my everyday life when I'm in a difficult situation. I just bring up, you know, what would I do if it was with Calypso? and it helps tremendously. He teaches me to be 100% present moment focus. He will notice immediately when I disconnect or if my mind wanders and he reacts vividly. And that's actually how I met Bob. Uh, <laughs> when I first got Calypso about seven years ago, I was cantering around in the arena, probably thinking about what I was going to cook for dinner. And um, instead of being 100% focused and before I know it, I was flying through the air over the fence and, landed on my hands and knees. <laughs> but with Bob's help, I was soon back on in writing, and I became, Bob taught me about awareness of my thought and brain patterns, so thanks Bob, <laughs> still writing. <laughs> I strive to become a more consistent, trust, trustworthy human in my horse's eyes in order to become the leader that he can trust. Calypso is a tough taskmaster, I must stay connected. That's the boy it's there. gorgeous. He is, yeah, he's yeah. sweet. <laughs> Calypso was the one horse who led me to delve much deeper into the relationships between horses and humans. What I found out was that in trying to understand my horses, I came to deeply understand myself. 
Since Calypso arrived in my life, I've gone on to study and explore equine facilitated wellness with Generation Farms, equine assisted learning, medicine horse work with the Chiron horses. I read hundreds of books. I studied with some amazing horse people from around the world. And I did all that trying to understand the horse <laughs> so that I could understand myself. One of these gurus was Klaus Hempfling in Denmark. I completed a one-year course with him, which included personal development, the world at present, um, the study of ancient cultures, as well as self-mastery in life and in front of horses. He says that in all traditions and ancient cultures, the horse was always recognized as a trigger for personal crisis. In modern terms, the horse has the ability to push your buttons and often reveal your deepest psychological wounds. The horse was a very important symbol in ancient times. When you look back at any ancient culture, wherever you are in the world, there was always like a material world and a spiritual world. And in every single culture in ancient times, there was a line, like a, a boundary between these worlds. And no matter where you were in the world, every single culture, there was an animal that traveled between the worlds. And in every single culture, it was the horse. The path towards leadership in the horse, in reality, is a path towards oneself. Authentic mastery with a horse means first you have to master yourself. To achieve this, you must understand life, you must understand the horse's nature, and you must understand yourself. Klaus didn't teach a method, but rather a way of being in life and in front of horses. Calypso has stepped forward to connect with so many people that we met riding on trails and those who came to visit us at home. I was often told of profound shifts that these people felt after being in Calypso's presence. I kept reading and researching and finding out why, because I knew something was happening, but I had no idea what it was. Something was taking place. Calypso would often step forward so strongly to connect with somebody that I'd have to follow his lead. Um, we used to ride at the Qualcomm Hatchery, and we went there often, and we would trail her over and unload the horses and tack up quickly. And when Calypso wants to communicate with me, he puts his big head right in front of mine, and he, he puts his eye beside mine, and then he'll stare at what he wants me to look at, or he's trying to communicate something. So he's, I'm putting on a saddle and his bridle, and he keeps looking, he keeps pulling and looking up the road. And I said, there's nothing there, there's no bear, there's no cougar, let's go. But he kept insisting. So within about a minute, this little van comes down, and I said, oh, there you go, it's a van, thanks for letting me know, let's go. And he's still pulling, and eight people get out, and this one woman's like, oh, what a pretty horse, can I pat him? So I said, okay, sure. So he immediately starts to scan her. And he's like, he's not even subtle. He's like, mm -hmm. and he's scanning chakras, because he does that. He's a little medicine horse. And so he, when he gets to the sacral area, he starts to snort and blow and then go to the ground. So what I know about what he's doing is he's trying to, he's trying to ground her. He's trying to balance the chakra. And he was stuck at the sacral chakra. She says, what is your horse doing? And I'm embarrassed because I don't know these people. <laughs> so I said, well, do you know what chakras are? And she said, actually, I do. I said, oh, good, great. Well, he's tr apparently trying to balance your sacral chakra. And she said, isn't that interesting? And she took off her jacket, and then she took off the sweater, and she had some kind of special sacral belt that she was wearing because she had some issues in that area. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's great. I hopped on. <laughs> but he would just choose people. I, didn't, I never knew why or when it was going to happen. One time the farrier came to trim his feet and she's filing them and he starts to fidget and he starts bashing his head around and then he puts his face up against my eye and I'm like, now what? And he's looking at Becky and, and so I just said, do you mind? She knows him. Okay. You know, he needs a minute. So I just walked him out and he kept going to her and I said, I think he wants to scan you. So sure enough, he scans her and he stays glued to her right arm and he's going up and down, snorting and breathing and then grounding. And so after a couple of minutes, he stopped, and he just sat there and went, basically, you can do my feet now. <laughs> so she said, man, he's good. She said, all the way over here in the truck, I had shooting pains up on my arm. But she never said. Wow. It's just, he just sensed the blockage mm. or the heat or the tension or whatever it is he does. Um, one July 1st, it was a beautiful morning. I always feed the horses at 6 for their first feed because they're starving. <laughs> And they have a barn that they um, can run in and out of, and they've got a big barn. So when I show up at 6 in the morning, they always run into the barn going, waiting for the big hay dump. And so this one morning, it was a gorgeous blue sky day, and we have four mares on the property line right beside us that belong to the neighbor. And they were just grazing, and so I throw the hay in, and Kalua comes 
barreling into the barn for dinner, and Calypso refuses. He won't come in the barn, and he's hyper vigilant, and he's like a little shaking. So I go to him and I go, what? And he puts his head here and he shows me the corner of the property. So, okay, maybe there's a bear or cougar because that happens. So I run out there, there's nothing. The sky is blue, it's beautiful. So I go back to him, I'm just scratching his withers, trying to comfort him because I know something's wrong. And he keeps glaring at me like he's a bit frustrated because he can't, he's trying to communicate something. So as we're standing there, I heard, we heard a loud crack and we just both turned at the same time. And again, he's like, now he's a bit angry. He wants me to go to that corner. So I run up there, there's nothing. And then I look up and I see a big gray cloud. I thought, well, that's odd. It was beautiful and blue before. And I realize it's smoke. So I run to the house to get my cell phone. Meanwhile, um, somebody had obviously seen it and called the fire department because sirens are coming everywhere. Well, the four mares go crazy. They're bucking and galloping. Kalua flies out of the barn going ballistic from all the noise, and Calypso walks in the bar and eats his hay. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Uh, that's why I did, he was always doing things like this, so that's why I started the research. It's like, something's going on with this. And he just looks so unassuming. He just like draws in his energy when he doesn't need it, and when he needs to communicate, he's big. So Tim Hayes has written an insightful book called Riding Home, The Power of Horses to Heal. In his first chapter, he speaks of the wild horses and the wild men with a fascinating story of the wild horse inmate program. It was originally an attempt to manage the wild mustangs and have the prison inmates guided and taught to gentle the wild horses, so it would be like cheap labor, and then they, you know, are able to rehome the mustangs. Being in the program was a privilege, and they had to qualify with a history of good behavior and recommendations. They were very motivated to succeed at their new job of gentling the horses. While working and gentling the horses, the prisoners started having profound and emotional breakthroughs. The Mustangs were deeply afraid, and they acted violent and aggressive, but they were actually scared to death, just like the men. So being tough and vicious was their only chance for survival, for the horses and for the men. The men could see that the horses' motive was fear, and just like the horses, they could identify with that. That's what they felt. They saw it in themselves, and they saw it in the horses. They began to feel perhaps compassion for perhaps the first time they may never have known or felt what that was like, but they were feeling it for the horses. So then they eventually would feel it for themselves and the others. Statistics, oh actually, they felt too that the horses could change, that maybe they could too. The statistics from 2010 show that America has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Three years after their release, 67% of former prisoners are rearrested and 52% are reincarcerated. It costs taxpayers $60 billion a year for this. The recidivism rate for inmates from the Wild Horse Inmate Program are half the national average. Many leave prison and become productive members of society. The relationships that are created between the inmates and the horses have achieved a level of human rehabilitation that billions of dollars and hundreds of years of traditional systems of incarceration have never been able to achieve. So on a lighter note, I'd like to talk a bit about the importance of play. I'm reading a book, this is my latest book I'm reading, it's, it's not about horses, it's about play. And it's how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination, and invigorates the soul. It's written by Dr. Stuart Brown. He's a psychiatrist, a clinical researcher, and the founder of the National Institute of Play. He shows how play is fun, but play is anything but trivial, as it's a basic biological drive as integral to our health as sleep and nutrition. He draws on his clinical research and observation of animals, as well as advances in neuroscience and psychology, to explore the power of play in the everyday world. It is defined as any kind of purpose, purposelessness, all-consuming, restorative activity, and the single most important factor in determining our success and our happiness. There's a story in the book about a CEO of a successful company, and she sees herself as blessed and fortunate. She's got a good work life, a great family life, but something was missing, joy. So she set about finding out where the joy had gone. She remembered back to her fondest childhood memories of bareback riding at age seven. She decided to make that happen again. She found a horse to ride. Feelings of joy and exhilaration returned the first time she sat on the horse. But what surprised her the most was since she incorporated the pure play of riding back into her life, is how complete and whole she feels in all areas of her life. 
The bloom of what she calls irrational bliss she experiences with her horses has spilled over into her family and work life. Play is a tremendously powerful force. It's an expression of pure joy and it comes from the heart. Horses love it and can often be found in a state of pure joy, just living in the present moment and just being alive. A bit of horsing around can be so good for you as nature is one of the greatest stress relievers and healers. I'm now in the process of writing a book called Keeping Kahlua, Memoirs of a Spirit Horse, and it's about this guy. I've given Kahlua his voice, and he tells his story of an unlikely hero, an aging arthritic horse with a lot of attitude. His future was uncertain, and he was deeply afraid. Against all odds, though, he finds his niche, and he lands himself a job in the corporate world. He works in the personal development department at Leap Zone Strategies now in the news. He co-partners with an equine strategist where he's busy changing the lives of leaders. He's been there a year now and they say he's gold, he rocks. <laughs> All the horses in my life have been a huge support in keeping me focused and moving forward. I was asked by Tim Hayes, the author of Riding Home, he said, what have horses taught you about yourself? And my first thought was, oh my, where would I even start? They've pretty much taught me everything about myself. It's what have they not taught me, maybe more like it. So, where can you go locally to be in the company of horses? I'd like to introduce Chris Morgan, a CHA riding coach and a student of Equine Facilitated Wellness. Thank you, Lois. That's really nice. I'm Christine Morgan. I am a CHA certified riding instructor, and I'm also working towards my certification in Equine Facilitated Wellness with EFW Canada, which is our national governing board. EFW Can is a professional community who values building respectful, trusting relationships through the human equine bond. Their holistic foundation offers a diverse array of opportunities for personal exploration and growth and professional development. I am also in my fourth year with Chiron Holistic Medicine Horse Training with Halliday Walsh. Horses are why I'm here today and why I've become the person I am. I also know how much horses have helped my own children in being able to deal with the challenges that they face on a daily basis, including bullying, self-esteem issues, anxiety disorder, as well as others. Growing up, I always knew there was more to these wonderful animals than just riding, as wonderful as that is. Um, that there's just so much more. I've spent time working at various barns, uh, an Arabian breeding farm, I've completed the equestrian program at Kempo Agricultural Technology, as well as the Quantlin College equestrian program locally. But it was not until meeting Halliday Walsh and being introduced to Generation Farms by Lois that I found what I have been looking for. They introduced me to the world of equine facilitated wellness and the horse's amazing ability to help humans heal, including myself. Equine facilitated wellness is the partnering of horses with human facilitators to support self-development and healing in people. The horses are regarded as sentient beings with dignity and wisdom all of their own. Their environment and sessions are set up in such a way that the horses are truly co-facilitators of the work. Scientific research has revealed that over 90% of language is nonverbal. Nonverbal language is not just the language of gesture and posture. It is also shown that the memory of trauma is stored in our cells and tissues as well as our minds. EFW is experiential somatic learning and horses are excellent at helping humans to release the memory of the trauma and to allow more holistic healing to take place. Recent studies conducted by the Institute of HeartMath provide a clue to explaining the bi-directional healing that happens when we are in the presence of forces. According to researchers, the heart has a larger electromagnetic field and higher level of intelligence than the brain. A magnetometer can measure the heart's energy field of our own, humans, radiating up to 8 to 10 feet around our body. While this is certainly significant, it's perhaps even more impressive that the electromagnetic field of a horse is up to five times larger. Mm -hmm. So imagine a sphere-shaped field that completely surrounds you. 
the horse's electromagnetic field is also stronger than ours and can actually directly influence our own heart rhythm. So horses are likely to have what science has identified as a coherent heart rhythm or heart rate pattern. And what this means is it explains why we feel better when we are around them because when we have a coherent heart pattern, it is a measure of how robust our well-being is and how consistent our emotional states of calm and joy are. We exhibit these patterns when we feel positive emotions. So you can see why if, this, if the horse is emitting this lovely electromagnetic field, why we feel better. Uh, a coherent heart pattern is also indicative of a system that can recover and adjust to stressful situations efficiently. Oftentimes, we only need to be in a horse's presence to feel a sense of wellness and peace. In fact, research shows that people experience many physiological benefits while interacting with horses, including lowered blood pressure and heart rate, increased levels of beta endorphins, neurotransmitters that serve as pain suppressors, decreased stress levels, reduced feelings of anger, hostility, tension, and anxiety, improved social functioning, and increased feelings of empowerment, trust, patience, and self-efficacy. Got it! <laughs> <laughs> I bring an integrative approach to my horsemanship sessions. I follow the EFW Canada approach and philosophy with my students and clients as I work towards becoming an EFW Canada certified equine professional. As such, I also use the FW CAN strategies and core exercises when working with horses and people, and these include the body scan, just checking in to see what your body is doing, working with uh, resourcing so that you can take these with you into the real world, lowering and raising energy, and boundary exercises, just to name a few. And these have been found to be very, extremely helpful to clients and students in the real world and able to deal with their environments. This is all done while working in a safe environment that allows the client to ex learn, explore, and learn about themselves. I have also partnered with Penny Martin to found Journey with Horses, which allows for a deeper exploration of the self in the company of horses. Penny brings many skills and years of experience to help guide clients on their journey to self, along with the horses and myself. And as uh, many of you probably already know, we have Chiron Holistics as well in Coombs, and it's just fabulous. Also from Riding Home, Tim Hayes, I have printed out this quote, but what can be hidden or disguised from a person can nevertheless always be seen and felt by a horse. No matter what we may do to cover up our emotions when we're with another person, a horse instantly knows exactly what we are feeling. More important, horses do not judge us. They only judge our actions. Horses accept us unconditionally. It is our behavior they deem to be acceptable or unacceptable, friendly or unfriendly. And now, Carolyn will talk about her experiences with the medicine horses. Thanks, Chris. Um, I was going to add lip, but I don't think I can remember what I'm going to say, so I'm going to read, if you don't mind. For myself, being in the company of horses has been nothing short of enchanting. Unlike Lois and Christine, I have no previous training in horsemanship or personal experience with horses. Yet, I have always felt drawn to them, whether by means of films, photos, portraits, or by the rare occasions when I've had an opportunity to see them from afar, grazing peacefully in a country meadow. They are eloquent, majestic beings, and though physically they are big and powerful, they possess an extraordinary intuitive knowing and gentleness that goes far beyond our human rationale. I've lived in Qualifum for a little over a year now, and upon meeting Lois, she has been instrumental in bringing me into the realm of horses. She introduced me to Calypso, her Andalusian Azteca gelding, teaching me how to groom, feed, and clean his stall, setting me on a course for my own journey with horses. 
presently with our mutual friend, Penny Martin. She and I have committed to doing our stewardship for the Chiron Medicine Herd twice per week. We are responsible for the welfare of these six incredibly magical beings. Our tasks are not merely the physical care of feeding, cleaning, and grooming with their permission. For it's my sense and belief that we gain so much more than we give. Horses live in the moment. They do not focus on the past or on what may come in the future. They're in the here and now. And with that in mind, they see us exactly as we are in any given moment. We as humans wear many different masks for our survival with each other. We cannot hide from them. They go much deeper. In fact, as the saying goes, the eyes are the mirrors of the soul. That's where they meet us. Without judgment, only acceptance and a willingness to trust. I do not subscribe to any organized religion. Yet, when I enter through the gate into their sanctuary, I feel as though I've been blessed, or at least accepted as I am. Perhaps that's the simple message they're so patiently waiting to share with us. So now, I'd like to invite you to come up and look at our books and our literature, as well as choose a card if you haven't already, and sort of um, it's go to the deck, uh, not the deck, but the book, and find out what your card says. It's a message for you individually on your own. And if you have any questions or suggestions, we're right here for you. Mm-hmm. Also, at the end, are you going to... Yes, I have. Um, Christine has another quote from... Um, it's a message from horses for all of us. But we'll let you get up and stretch and have a look around. And if you have any questions, please come mm-hmm. up and talk to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if everybody is satisfied or has had a chance to ask their questions, um, Chris would just like to read you something. It's a message from the horses for all of us. Um, so this is actually from Jess Catman's herd. She's um, guided by Equus, and she's also an equine facilitator um, with her own business in Alberta. And when she was preparing for the Horse Healing Summit in 2017, this is what came from her herd. It is without judgment that we seek to be honored and seen for that which we came here to be. So to be allowed to be true to ourselves, that we find no greater glory than in witnessing the vast unfolding of all that is to come forth. Truly, I tell you, let no man walk alone, for he finds himself lost in a desperate attempt to find himself. We are the holders of time immortal, and while there has been great evolution here on earth, we remain true to the nature of our being, here to help through the remembrance of the truest nature of self, to bring the unequal's will, the voice of sovereignty, to reach deep into the wave of consciousness. For in those that hear us and carry our message, we anchor into form the heaven on earth connection, the soul living a life through form, the vastness of all that is possible reflected through the unequal purity and splendor of what it is to be alive, to be life itself exemplified. There is no greater honor than to be seen for that which one is, in one's truest nature, without without encumbrances, and as a dignified soul. For that which we are is that which we see. Make no mistake, you are here for fulfillment of purpose through living as we have come to live to bear witness to the glory of that which we are, to bring unencumbered sentience, to carry and hold what you call unconditional love. For us, there is no other way of being, of living. We are here with you to hold, to heal, to unify, to reach, release, and raise, to bring light to truth, to glorify without identifying, because is it not the glorious image and feeling that carries you upon thinking, feeling, and seeing us? We ask that you recognize this within you. There is much healing that can happen for all. When we can hold, although hold is not the right word, but rather carry through, allow, send the wave of our most instinctive and intrinsic nature of grace glorified, 
through form and feeling, when this becomes the true nature that you recognize and live through them, through, then what you have been called to become is creating your life through you, creating the wave of evolution. As I tell this to you, may you recognize this within you. Let no more time pass where you do not honor yourself in this way, as we honor you for being part of this wave of conscious evolution. It has not been an easy journey, and we, like you, carry many wounds. But in truth, I tell you, we have not come here to heal ourselves, but rather to heal each other. It is by our authentic presence alone that we give the gift that unites and heals. When we do not or cannot know, see or understand this, we, as do you, take on these wounds ourselves and become the wounded rather than the source of the healing. We are no different. Many of us are the reflection of the wounds carried by man. And so it is through compassion and the truest nature of the soul self when allowed to be in full authentic presence that the healing and reunification happens. And so we call this forth in you, that you have come to serve as we have, that you have come to this circle to indeed become the wave that led you here. And so it is. Sorry? Was it channeled? This was channeled by just counting from her herd. I agree. Of horses. Okay. So there was a question about how ethically could we use horses as therapy. Mm -hmm. And the horses said, we are here to help you together to heal each other. Okay. Okay. So again, um, if anybody's interested, of course, I can uh, send this to Bob or whoever. Yeah, send it on. Copy that. Yeah, that would be okay. Mm. I'm getting better. <laughs> the first time I did not make it through that. <laughs> it did beautifully. Yeah. I think when you experience um, what it feels like to be with the horses, sometimes you become very emotional because it's, um, as Klaus Halfling said, um, when the truth is spoken, the tears fall. Mm -hmm. mm. so. mm. and, and personally, um, I've had so many shifts. Um, just being with the horses and, I mean, one time, my good old guy, he was 30 when he passed away last year, um, I turned him out my field and there was a few other horses there and a new one. Well, I saw this horse starting to come for me, I'm like, oh crap, <laughs> I cannot get away fast enough to a safe place because I knew she was coming for me. He turned, looked at me, looked at her and just catch her across and cut her off. I mean, that's a connection. Mm -hmm. um, we've been through a few times together. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just a fantastic horse, and so are my other guys. And we all have so many stories of what horses have done for us. Jeepers on Bunda psychologist. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 They're my parents. <laughs> okay, no, back door and here I go. Well, Generation Farms, actually, where we studied and did our courses, they're actually um, equine facilitated psychotherapists and mental health therapists and social mm -hmm. workers and nature therapists. Mm -hmm. They've been around for 30 years and they never advertise. And where are they located? They're in Yellow Point now. So it's, oh, about, yeah, it's just under an hour, it's like yeah. 50 minutes or something to there. And they have 35 acres and it's so beautiful. Nice. And they actually co founded EFW Canada. And what does EFW do? Equine Facilitated Wellness. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. actually her daughter who coined that term. So they're pretty amazing people. They're amazing and they, they teach you the science, they teach you all about their, our nervous systems and, and going mm -hmm. into synthetic and parasynthetic. So they supply yeah. all the science behind what goes on between horses and humans. And of course, there's so, and there's even much more than just the science of it too. Mm -hmm. So they have a herd of 14 mm -hmm. and all of their horses are well versed in the work. And they debrief the horses after the finish. They don't work them to it. Like, you know, if a horse doesn't want to join in that day, the horse does not have to because the whole point is you're working with a sentient being. So you cannot force the horse therapy on a horse. Like, he, they, they either step forward to do the work or they don't. 
and Calypso, I mean, I don't do this work. He's, he's just my writing companion, um, my buddy, but he has stepped forward all by himself over and over again. So I studied, started to study at Generation Farms because of him. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, I had to find out what was going on, and then it just never and stops. <laughs> He's the reason I started studying with Halliday. <laughs> so it's an amazing job she did with her. So I'm like, I've got a problem. <laughs> you might be caught. And it just went from there. The other thing about working with horses um, is they're so good at helping to build self-confidence and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And for me, being bullied and all that through school, they really helped make me see that I did have worth. Mm -hmm. And not to believe all these other people. Mm -hmm. And as a you know young teenager on a very small island where everybody knows everybody, they were a blessing. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, because you can't if you can't bully a horse when you're working on an interaction without equipment and they're at liberty to leave. Yeah, um, your leadership style shows up really quickly. I actually saw a video recently. I shared it on my Facebook, so I could probably find it again, and I can't remember the gist of it, but it was, and the reason I shared it was because it was the difference between breaking a horse mm -hmm. and working with a horse, mm -hmm. and you could very much see this person with just in a few minutes took this horse that didn't want to be in there, didn't want to be around that person, and then they were having a wonderful relationship after just a few minutes, and I know it's because that person was honoring that animal and where they were at at that moment. And so my reason for sharing it was, see, this is the difference. Yeah. And when you have this kind, because you, you were mentioning the, the channel message from this herd about mm -hmm. being used, right? Yeah. And that's the difference. When you can be on the same level as mm -hmm. this sentient being, they will offer themselves yeah. to be used, maybe that's a bad word. To co yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But they are yeah. 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 to do it. Yeah, whereas we're not just taking from them. That's right. And they they acknowledge that too. Like when you learn to read their body language, you know that they're they're in and they're in a hundred ten percent. Um, they give you a lot more than they give back because once you gain that trust, but you can't break the trust, and that can be challenging mm -hmm. sometimes too because we, as humans, don't see what they see. So Calypso is hyper vigilant all the time. He hears and sees everything. Like he'll just, I'm like, oh yes, there's a rabbit. Thank you. You know, like, and he wants me to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Did you see the rabbit? Yeah, I didn't need his attention too. <laughs> It's funny when you were mentioning in the beginning about uh, uh, horses being um, prey animals, because we really don't have a lot of things that would prey on horses around here. I suppose we have cougars, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah. Dogs. Packs of dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. they're predators. So they're hardwired not to form relationships with predators, and that's what we are. So, you know, you see these horses, so many are dead, but they are not going to be as tuned in as these two because they have had their spirit so fear. broken. Yeah. And they always learned how to say So they give up. They gave up. They comply because they're just disassociated yeah. from the world. They won't spook because they're like, they're just dead. And dead. Or when they do, it's massive. Yeah. yeah. Because it's years and years mm -hmm. built up, whereas these two are reacting on like those elephants that run a mock to surface, right? Mm -hmm. That type of thing, yeah. Yeah, because there's just so much pressure building in. It's like a lot of people are disassociated from mm -hmm. like they're not reacting, right? They're not tuned in. Mm -hmm. So because of especially Calypso, mm -hmm. I've become more sensitive more than we learned at Generation Farms to what's it called? Sensing ears? Felt senses. Felt senses. So there's way more than five senses. Mm -hmm. We can take information in with just the way the horses do with every cell in your body. You and you said something about 10,000 different facial expressions? Yeah, I, I actually was watching wow. that show of the nature of things. It had nothing to do with horses, um, but I found it fascinating because that's what I study body language from Calypso is teaching me. And uh, they were so excited because they have computers that can read the body language at the end of the show, and I'm thinking, just get a horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can also teach boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it's like for autistic children or people who may not know how to either set a boundary or to let other see. people set yeah. them, the horses are very clear. You enter my boundary, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also if they come too close, how empowering is it to be able to say, no, mm -hmm. stop there. And have that large animal respect yeah. Yeah. Especially, that. Especially, and they teach... And to be able to work with these animals. Yeah. How does, 
How can that not help you develop your self-confidence? Mm -hmm. It's good for young, like teenage girls learning boundaries. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're, they have that power to like they know. say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the courses they give at Generation mm -hmm. Farms. Like you work with young teenagers, um, mm -hmm. and it's very empowering because it's just the way you even carry yourself. That speaks like, you know, if you're dealing with 1,200 pounds, you won't be a problem. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But um, it's more like it's energetic. Mm -hmm. So if you stretch up tall, then the horse is like, oh. But if you crouch down low, then the horse is going to be tempted just to walk into your back. So it doesn't matter if you're tiny and the horse weighs 1,200 mm -hmm. pounds and you weigh 100 pounds. It's the presence. It's the presence. Yeah. Like you're, you're an energy or force to be reckoned with. And they're, but they'll only respect it if you're fair. Mm -hmm. And that's the interesting thing. Like they'll, you know, might send me respect, you know, if you've got, you know, a two by four, but they're not forming a relationship. It's just fear. Yeah. Right. And that's what you don't want. You mm -hmm. want if because you can't um, simulate every situation to um, desensitize your horse. So if your horse, like say, if we had an airplane land right or take off right above us one time, horse will trust me. So it's roaring right mm -hmm. over her head, and I'm cantering down the road, like oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, became part of him and I communicated with him. So, okay, but it's an airplane. It's energy. You know, I was like, whatever he understood, he was okay. Yeah. But if I didn't have that trust, if he didn't trust me, mm -hmm. he would have just probably lost his mind. Because you know? <laughs> they do can flip into right brain flight. Yeah. And if they flip, um, some of them just don't come back quickly to the left, the thinking side of their brain. Yeah. It's just like that's right, we have to fight, flight, or freeze, as <laughs> horses do too. And as long as we humans can keep them grounded and remind them that we are safe, then they feel safe. But if we also go into fight, fight, or freeze, they're like, see ya. Yeah, they're going to save themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're no afraid. longer part of their herd. Yeah. You're disassociated. And that's why they want to balance you. That's why, like, when Calypso was sensing imbalance in, like, when the farrier came or when people come to visit and have tea in the barn, and he would get agitated because um, in a herd, if you have one unbalanced member, then the whole herd is at risk. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs to be balanced, and the leaders need to be very balanced, like, we're the only species that collects unbalanced. <laughs> 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 because the horses can't afford that, they'd be dead. Yeah they'd be, you know, more um, open to predators and baiting. So um, Calypso is very adamant, like, you know, he's always wanting me to make sure when he tells me something, he wants me to look. And he's a lot happier if I notice it first because then he knows he can trust me. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I haven't developed on my horse since. <laughs> so. And as probably a lot of people know, you need to be in present moment focused to start the healing with the trauma because that's where it is. If you know that you're safe in that moment, you can start to heal and sing for the horses. And so that's the uh, feeling that you can then take with you into your everyday life, going, I am safe, mm -hmm. and believe it. Yeah. And that's uh, really, and then that judgment. Even though we go to therapy and therapists, how many of us go, oh, I'm sure I'm being judged? Mm -hmm. The horses. They're only judging you as was mentioned by Carolyn earlier in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. They're not worried about the past or the yeah. future. Right here. Right and the now. second you change something and shift something, the horse reacts to it. It's, yeah. it's really beautiful when you see it. When you're taught to watch for it, you see the lick or two and sigh and you know, like if I go in to get clips on his paddock or maybe I'm feeling something, and he's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's and I go, Oh. And as soon as I change it, instantly he changes. I watch it and see it, his eyes become big and soft and, you know, he lowers his head and he comes on over. So they are such a barometer of what's going on inside of you. And you can raise and lower the energy and you can watch your horse react to it. I would say that the first real big shift I was aware of through a generation of Kong, um, <laughs> they had this lovely black mare named Morgana. Um, and I've had social anxiety and you know, being bullied on all that. So one of my big fears is rejection. And I couldn't even get near the round pen before I started bawling. Because I was afraid this mare would reject me. I walked in there, she gave me a hug. Oh. Like, how big is that? 
Um, but that's how moving and profound these shifts yes, can be. Right. She noticed this. Yes. It did. Yes, it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> and the very next day, I saw Christine, and like, because I've known Chris for years, and I'm like, what happened to you? It must have been something that happened yesterday. <laughs> All of a sudden, like, she's beaming, and she's just standing, and it's like, I saw it overnight, like, literally overnight. Um, because we had worked with Morgana and Spencer, I think, a few weeks before that, and then made a session. The horses actually choose you. Um, mm -hmm. You resonate with the horse, so they do something called meet the herd. And what's really fascinating about this is they don't tell you any of the history. They might be numbered just for ease, one to ten, in different paddocks. And you have a piece of paper in a notebook, and you learn to do a quick body scan to see where you have a little tightness. That's all, and you hear the wind, and you're just aware and in the moment. And you write down the first thing that comes to your head. And if there's nothing, that's correct also. So you're given, I don't know, 15 minutes and there's no correct amount of horses to visit. It's just whatever. So then when we, the first time we did that, it was Morgana for you and Spencer for me. So we go into the debriefing room and um, talk about her experience. And then she gives us afterwards, she gives us a uh, history of all the horses that we went to visit. And we're looking at the ones that spoke, spoke to us and we're like, oh my God. Like they're us, you know. It's 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 interesting because we have no background on horses. Mm -hmm. We don't know their stories, and when you hear the story of the horse that you resonate it with, it's just, you know, it may be different every time, but it's what you're feeling at the moment, and there's a resonance there. And for Christine, it was Morgana, and so then we got to go back in a few weeks and I work with the horse I chose us. So. This was your second visit. Mm -hmm. I was running too, but Morgana's going to choose a big, huge, beautiful man. Yeah, it was extremely moving. The therapist almost got to. <laughs> this. I just had a question. Mm -hmm. You're saying they're always in the present. I'm sure if if the if an animal, mm -hmm. a, a horse, has been mistreated by one particular person, you don't think they're going to remember that when that person comes near them. Yes, the but that's the present they, again. They can be triggered just like yeah. we can. Mm -hmm. But they don't um, stay up at night worrying about it, thinking how unfair the world is that that person exists. Like they just you don't know. Um, no, well, I'm actually, um, um, uh, the fellow, the equine specialist that came from uh, Australia, um, he says that horses actually have a photographic memory. In like they take a picture of, say, uh, I don't know, a red furry ball attack them, and they they take a picture of it. They see in pictures. Whereas we as humans would go on and on and say how unfair it is in the world that they're right here. We make a big story out of it. We make a big story out of it. And we keep bringing the story up and every time the story changes, right? Horses don't do that. They don't think about it again until they see it again. See it again. 20 yeah. years later, it's like, well, that's what I mean. They so they know so somebody that hurt them or harmed them or yeah. them yeah. So when they show up again, that's again, it's their present mm -hmm. moment, what's in front of them. And so that's that how they heal too, is what we keep them in their present moment focus and let them know that it is safe. Doesn't mean it will completely go away, but it goes a long way just like with us. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. We could go on all night, honestly. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all. Thank you. No, I just want to thank you, lovely ladies. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I was telling them I think I just about started crying a few times <laughs> as they were speaking because the stories are so lovely. So thank you. And uh, no meeting next month because we're into Christmas. And then we're back in January. And you'll just keep an eye out for an email uh, on the next topic. And it'll be the third Thursday, right? We're staying on the third Thursday. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.